folks how's it going red master here back once again over on youtube it has been a hot minute i will admit nearly two weeks i think since i posted a video on the channel probably one of the more longer runs i've recently done without uploading any sort of content it's weird it, it has been weird i've been meaning to put more content out but uh, if you guys have been keeping up with some of the socials and some of the updates here on youtube things have been a little chaotic in the life of red uh catching a stomach virus going to vegas catching covid it's been shot after shot after shot but thankfully now as we're kind of getting the final bouts of covid out of the system i don't know if you can still hear in my voice a little bit left in there uh but that's not going to stop me from kind of jumping back onto the content train and for today's video we have something a little bit controversial now let me tell you right uh, up front the community loves when i do tier lists right no you all love to disagree with with my opinions in regards to tier lists i figured you know what why not do another one and today we're going to be looking at the epic cards in the game we started i think the last one we did maybe wasn't even on legendary cards but i know i had i had planned to do legendary epic rare etc like go down the line of rarities for cards to put on the tier list um and i kind of just got lost in that uh in, in other projects so i'm jumping back in we're doing epic cards today uh the tier under legendary the weird sort of subspace for cards that are pretty powerful but don't exactly have what it takes to crack into that legendary ranking and uh well i don't think i need to further explain what a tier list is so let's go ahead and jump right to it all right folks and here we go into the tier list now about 58 cards to cover from across all of the factions within the game so to kind of keep things moving at a decent pace here we're not gonna be going too deep into a lot of these cards some cards obviously we'll talk about um maybe in a little bit more detail on why they go in a certain tier but for the most part we're gonna have to kind of keep things moving uh the best we can here also gonna try and keep the editing manageable so that way again keep things on track and hopefully uh we won't be here you know two hours explaining every single card uh so let's go ahead and get started all right, and the first card on our list is Ancient Arbor. Now, unfortunately, as much as I would hate to start off this list on a downside, uh, Arbor is one of those cards that I think is just not really worth it at this point in time. I mean, it's a strong, beefy body. It's nice to have in, you know, turn six, but uh, it's slow. Its summon sickness is pretty detrimental and uh, usually is not making its way over to the other side of the board without running into some kind of issue. Usually by the late game, too, you're seeing cards like Northland's Ranger and, um, you know, Craxis, Minotaur, Griffin. Uh, things that, you know, Ancient Armor can hold against pretty well, but are going to be taking a large chunk out of it and ultimately probably leading to Ancient Armor's downfall pretty easily. Uh, it just doesn't seem worth it when you can include those other options like the Ranger, the Minotaur, the griffin while being maybe in the same or a little later bit of the uh later cost uh you know ranger at seven minotaur six griffin six much like the ancient arbors at six uh you can get a faster creature for you know relatively similar style line sure it's not eight nine uh but you know it is six seven five eight you know those aren't numbers to scoff at either so i think people just prefer those faster uh more uh immediate impacting units uh, over arbor so uh yeah arbor definitely not worth uh, the shards to craft so if you, if you got them you you know keep them sure but i wouldn't recommend crafting it funny sense the imagination uh and uh, on to there we go to behi mothra behi mothra looks like he might be coming in uh maybe around a b tier to be honest, uh, I mean, I see Ajira get use out of him in monster strategies. He could become a big, stupid bungus as well. Not too bad, but again, it's just really big unga bunga. Like, it doesn't do anything else spectacular. Nothing that really breaches the A or S tier levels of good. 
but you know he, he can grow very very powerful very big if you have the support to kind of back him up you know whether you're bouncing a jira's just have a lot of monsters in deck i think he's he's fine for what he is he's he's pretty good and then moving on you got blessing of the trends blessing of the trends probably our first c maybe uh, honestly this one can go either way c or maybe in the higher tiers as well uh the 2-2 is great uh but the movement debuff is pretty killer you have to kind of know how and when to play around it which is pretty easy just take your action just take the movement first then equip blessing and then do the damage which i mean two two for one gold you know i you could see probably uh, actually do i want to bump this up to an a tier now that i'm talking about you know how good it is because i mean i i've seen it used pretty well i've used it quite well myself i don't think it deserves c tier honestly uh, you know maybe a b tier maybe we'll maybe i'll we'll compromise here we'll put it at the beginning of b maybe not so much as a c tier card uh maybe it does deserve to be pushed up quite a bit because two two for one gold is pretty important especially in an age where stats are the name of the game here if you've got the bigger stat line you just win out so yeah maybe i was downplaying that a little too much so i think b tier fits quite well southward captain the next one on the dock here my man instantly gonna get that s tier promotion uh, Captain is nearly in every pirate deck you might play against here. His ramp in uh, the treasure uh, on summon is just very, very useful, bringing you directly from the, you know, turn four to turn six, which is a huge jump. Also can do some Dramoth shenanigans if you've got, you know, 10 gold, the extra two gives you the Dramoth. Uh, the repost damage is, you know, stupidly powerful. Uh, being able to smack for four instead of two means that is trading most of the time with, you know, whatever early game units it goes up against. Uh, Captain all around, just a fantastic unit here and one that, uh, yeah, definitely deserves to take that S tier ranking. And uh, another card that we're talking about that seems to be pretty high up in that rankings is the Cleric. Now, Cleric, probably A tier. Honestly, not. I don't think S tier worthy. I, I don't. I don't think S tier is proper for cleric. Cleric is certainly a great card here and very annoying to deal with in the early game here. But he does have his faults um, throughout the rest of the game. If uh, well, kind of try to break this down here. Uh, cleric in the early is very very strong, very powerful. Uh, being able to nearly heal itself every time it gets hit. Uh, you know, say by a Dwarven Miner, it takes a 3 damage, it heals a 3 damage right back onto itself here, provided you have no castle damage. It's a card that can stay around for a bit. But, say if you get into the later portion of the game and you do see Cleric, there are usually bigger things contending the board at that time. So having Cleric walk out and do like 3 damage and then instantly die may not be very good. 2 or 3, excuse me, if you have globals on the board. Um... It may not be, you know, super impactful. Sure, the healing could go somewhere useful, but at that point, Cleric doesn't really accomplish a hell of a lot here. So, uh, kind of a duality issue going on with this card here. Very powerful, very dominant in the early game, uh, but very lackluster and very, uh, yeah, I wouldn't say useless, but definitely not as, uh, not, not, a, not as a big of a monster as it is in the early game. So, uh, I think for that, definitely going to go in the A tier for their, uh, his contributions there. And following up, we've got the Con Artist. Uh, con Artist, uh, again, might have to go with a B tier on this one. I'll put, yeah, I'll put you here, why not? I think Con Artist, you know, when you talk about Con Artist, there's a discussion between him and Captain when and when not to include uh them in decks i feel con artist is a very weird uh version of the captain that just kind of exists out there um he, he can gain two gold in a turn much like the captain can but it's not immediate it's not guaranteed uh one is through combat one is through awaken um you know it has some synergies with the awaken strategy uh normally though ends up just being tossed in for more school fodder when you're trying to get some draw off of uh school of knowledge i it, i don't really feel like it provides much else to it usually when people want ramp they go with the southport captain because i know it's guaranteed and uh with connor you're always taking a chance that you're just gonna lose out on the ramp and be stuck at you know the turn four when you had a big turn six play to make you know but hey you're missing now the two extra gold from it 
from the ramp, why couldn't you have gotten that earlier uh, with Captain? Instead, you had to take the risk, and now it's, you know, dead with Con Artist. Just kind of see where I'm going with that. So, uh, definitely strong, though, because you do have, again, that ramp potential, being able to go into uh, turn six plays on turn four, etc., etc., uh, but I think it's because it's a little more, uh, not guaranteed per se that you're going to get that ramp here. It's a, it's a bit of a weaker card. So for that, Connors will be another addition to the B tier. All right. And next up, we've got Dragon Crest Shield. A little bright, I think, on this screenshot that I got, but, uh, we'll, we'll work with it. Uh, <laughs> Dragon Crest Shield, Ah, uh, is a little bit more of a hard one to figure out here. It might be a C tier. And honestly, this one can probably be open for debate. I think, I think I'm more willing to take more opinions on this card right here. But honestly, it doesn't feel as impactful as it should. I mean, you're gaining two armor. You're drawing every time a unit is hit off of it. Uh, I think the issue with this card is going to be very easily played around. Um, things like burn can just instantly cut through it or removal can instantly cut through whatever unit has it and you now no longer get any draw of it. You're just going neg one, uh, which is not exactly great um, in any sort of case here. So I just don't think it's worthwhile when you could be doing something like putting a blacksmith down, establishing a global buff for your units. Or something else that just makes uh, the game progress more in your favor a little bit better than taking a risk and going, hey, Dragon Crush Shield, and then boop, your unit's gone. Sorry, you don't get any draw. Uh, <laughs> it just doesn't feel uh, super great. Maybe if it had like deflection too, so that way you're guaranteed the draw. Uh, it would be higher because then like, okay, you're, you know you're not going to just be dying to spell removal. Uh, at that point, you can maybe comfortably put it on a bigger threat here and be guaranteed a card or two so uh yeah but for that it, you know it lacks deflect they'd be easily played around for that it's gonna go in the c tier and following that another crusader card defiance let me show you where this goes boom right there in the keep your shards pile uh honestly it's just a gimmick card it it's you know swap attack and defense great if you've got the gimmick strategy if that's what you're you're memeing to do but uh, if you want to play on the more competitive side, Defiance is probably not the way to go. Uh, and then, as I say that, someone's going to now make the Defiance deck to uh, show me that I'm wrong. Super genius. All right, next up, we've got Dragon Bolt. Uh, you know what? It's just another one of those terrible cards, man. Uh, <laughs> it's... When you look at it, gaming the chain lightning is cool, but just having that one so much less impactful than the Temple of the Five Gods, which is a permanent one for all units. It's, you know, not like a lightning blade, which is later on on this list here, as you can see, which is a chain three. It's a very, very minute chain lightning that doesn't really accomplish, I think, what players want to in the grand scheme of things. Plus, dragon decks are looking for a little bit more than just a singular discount chain scenario here. So, uh, they'll usually just look away from this card. And uh, yeah, because of that, Dragon Ball has to just be a card that is just not worth it in the slightest. So, hold on to your shards uh, if you're thinking about cracking that card. And if you don't, if you already have it, I recommend disenchanting it. It is just probably not worth it. And we move on from one dragon spell to another. Dragon training, I believe, is up next. And uh, uh, probably going to go in the C tier as well. Again, contender for F in my opinion. But dragon training, a card that is really just, hey, discount all the dragons for one turn. Draw a card. It's okay for the dragon strategy, but I mean, other than just getting that bigger swarm out on the board potentially earlier, it doesn't really accomplish a whole lot else. Uh, you know, if your opponent can counteract what dragons you've got incoming, or say you don't draw into a dragon to help facilitate the swarm, kind of just panders out here and you've lost a major milestone play on turn three, which is a very impactful turn. We've, uh, we've kind of uh, learned over the years that turn three is when things start to get going on the board here. And if you're doing you know draw pass turn three it's not looking too good for you at that point so uh yeah for that dragon training gonna go in the c tier alongside dragon crest shield 
Following that, we've got Drain Life here, and Drain Life, honestly, a card that has uh, always had my heart, and uh, for that, going in the A tier. Not S tier, because I don't think every deck really can run Drain Life, and for that, it's not really a universal card like Captain. Uh, but for what it is, it is a very, very powerful card. Two damage being based anywhere is important. Of course, that could be a finishing blow to the castle. It could be uh, a building removal. It could be, you know, unit removal as it's intended to be. Uh, it could be all of those different things here. So you've got that universal burn targeting, but also the plus two plus two, which we've already established in Blessing of the Trends, can be very powerful. Being able to, you know, quickly pump up a unit here. Uh, and of course, with stats being the major play of the game, it's very dangerous to have a plus two plus two in your back pocket uh, at any given time. So I think for those two reasons combined, being both burn and a plus two, it creates a very dangerous card all at the cheaper cost of four gold. Uh, I think definitely worth uh, playing if you are in the Warlocks. And of course, we've seen Drain Life being used for uh, with great success over the recent years so definitely deserves its a tier spot and from that we move on to the sharpshooter uh sharpshooter honestly uh what do i say about sharpshooter i i think i think for now i'm tentatively gonna put him in the b tier i mean he's a fine card can be very funny with combinations from dwarven scope it is technically a better range unit if it can get the awaken off it can kind of out snipe uh, units, if you will, which is pretty cool, uh, but, you know, it usually is for burn removal, it, it is a burn magnet, um, doesn't stick around the board for too long, usually, uh, which is a shame, but if, we, if he does stick around, it gets pretty fun, so I do think B tier is pretty fair to put him, but I can see justification for maybe him going higher as well. Alright, next up is this little punk-ass bastard. All right, and I mean, yeah, as much as I hate this, you know, piss elf looking piss head, uh, it is going to be an A tier card in, in all honesty. It is, it is a strong one. Maybe not exactly S tier worthy, because again, much like the sharpshooter, it feels like it's a burn magnet, usually dies off pretty quickly. Um, but if it does stick around, it does get pumped up, it does become quite the beefy hoss, and a fast one at that. Being able to move forward with that fast keyword is something that you should definitely not overlook. And uh, with extra movement to it, whether from a swiftness, lunging attack, etc. That 5 movement is something that I think is very rarely seen in the game uh, or in most games. But one that uh, can really switch things up if your opponent is not careful about it. So uh, yeah, I think A tier deserved for Magic Eater. Again, probably could make an argument for S tier. But for now, I think leaving him in A is fine. And we move from one ninja card to another in Eternity Strike. And I think for this one, we're going to have to go to the other end of the spectrum. You're putting it in C tier. Now, usually you are committing an entire turn to playing in Eternity Strike. Uh, but it does, you know, it, or at least for winning the game. That is what E-Strike is usually done for. It's usually this big OTK, out of nowhere card, you know, dealing eight damage somewhere on the board two additional times and usually you're hoping for that to be the castle and then that's like 16 or you know uh 18 damage points worth of life feeling dealt to the castle has to do math i don't know why i struggled with that for a minute uh but usually it is sort of the game ender otk card that ninja cards like ninjas like to play sometimes um I don't think it's very reliable, though. It's not very good, especially if you're facing off against, you know, decks with a lot of things on the board. Things like the Mystic Rats or the sort of Swarm deck. Usually when they have a lot of creatures out, it's hard to pinpoint specific targets. Usually it's a big old lottery reel about where your, you know, E-Strikes hit. And if you use two of them popping two Wrath, congratulations, you wasted seven gold for that. Uh, I don't think it's very, you know, reliable. I don't think it's very consistent to be running all the time. But I do recognize that it is a, you know, big OTK enabler. And for that, we are keeping it out of the F tier. It does have its moments for sure. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's going to be a fine place for E-Strike. Moving on, though, Dragon's Fire, our next card. And Dragon's Fire, uh, incredible. It is an S tier card. It is virtually... A Warlock deck without Dragon's Fire is not a Warlock deck at all. Uh, it's become one of those cards that has just been 
so so widely versatile so widely used it's a three damage aoe to the entire board for enemies only that can do a lot of damage of course it does not take out buildings but for the most part it's usually being uh utilized to clear uh big boards and it has done that it has been there have been times where i've seen it or have been on the receiving end or have caused a dragon's fire to completely wipe board and, and at that point it can be a massive game changer a massive uh turn of the tide if you will when dragon's fire is played and uh, if people don't really run dragon's fire they're missing out on a huge opportunity to just have a little back pocket board clear in your deck at all times to uh, deliver a little bit of relief uh, if in case you know things out of hand with mystic rats or zombies or hell you just got to clear some things in the bag maybe you've got a weakened range unit from something just throw dragon's fire down pop it move on with your day it, it is just a huge huge lifesaver so dragon's fire definitely definitely an s tier level card and of course then going into another warlock card we've got primordial flame flame honestly a little bit tricky to put a tag on uh mainly because it is primarily only used in rush based strategies usually nothing else and i don't know it doesn't really feel like it deserves anything higher than a c tier i mean it gets scary yeah when it does you know the battle ready and becomes a 2-8 but like if you're just running down the primordial flame usually it can be stopped in the early game too if your opponent has the right scenario here or have things like fear which push it back into your own castle potentially doing some self-harm to you if you're not careful i think it definitely is a prize c tier level card but of course again open to more interpretation on that one but uh for for what it does and for its you know big purpose in life it, it kind of just feels it kind of feels empty it it, it kind of just uh, does not have any sort of higher calling to me right now than a c I definitely not an f tier because i can respect you know the big flame growing like you know 2 8 you know 4 10 I, I can respect that i can understand why you want to play that then because primordial flame is a fat two drop at six health on the dot i i, I get it i get it but uh I, I don't think it's very much worthy outside of that purpose and for that it's gonna be in a c tier for me and then, of course, the Vicious Sunflower, the following card here. I've been seeing this card gain a lot of traction recently. Uh, I think it does pretty well at what it does. Uh, and I think some people might want me to put this in A tier. I think I can respect the A tier choice. I'm kind of hovering, though, between the two. I'm going to leave it at the top of B for now. I can definitely see, though, it creaking into a tier over the next few months or so as people get more and more comfortable with it finding more and more uses for it as a tool although i think for me this is this is nothing on the sunflower by the way i i can respect it i just need to see it in action more it is going to be a b tier for me i think it's a fine card to run in the early of course it helps out the last will strategy if you're running that it can do you know some pretty effective clearing on some horse uh, if you've got uh any of that stuff going on in the early game uh but i think outside of that eh, the summon sickness really does hurt it it is a slow moving unit it doesn't really deserve s tier that's for sure but i think i think at the top of b maybe creaking into a i think is a fair ranking for the flower all right next up gonna be a little bit of a two for one special here as we've got both flames of eternity and fork lightning conveniently they're going in the same place which is going to be f tier in my opinion Honestly, these traps aren't really that great. I mean, you could get more use out of flames, sure, but usually in Warlocks, you want, like, the actual removal. Things like Blue Fire Bolt in that column. So, to be running the flame trap and hope that, you know, the right unit gets burned off is a bit of a risk. I think, think it's worth taking uh, when you're looking to run Flames of Eternity here. And Fork Lightning, let me tell you, tell you Fork Lightning is absolute garbage. Um, you know, sure, it's a funny chain. It's a knockback it doesn't it, it's it's just hot garbage man it's probably the trap that no one plays so many more better options when you're looking to play traps might of the minotaur and avalanche definitely exceed fork lightning by miles they're they're these two are just traps that no one really runs and it it shows that they're just not reliable they're not consistent they're not great they're not good 
So for that reason, both of them are going to be a, uh, a hard pass, a little bit of a keep your shard moment uh, for me there. So I, I know probably Flames of Eternity deserves more of a chance than Forked Lightning, but right now I'm feeling like Flames isn't doing a hell of a lot these days. So for that, it's going to go in the F tier. And following that, we got Face of the Dragon. Uh, honestly, I think like, another C tier card uh, going on over here. Uh, it's not terrible, but I do think that uh, having all those dragons assembled at the right time to use Face of the Dragon could be a little time consuming, especially when you could just win without it. Um, be dragons are already somewhat beefy, so to be running additional beef uh, in the, in one singular spell for the super dragon is cool for an OTK strategy, but uh, beyond that, I don't think really people, exp I, they don't use this too much, especially when they can run things like the permanent global buffs for every unit, or, you know, they can run the dragon temple, or they could run, uh, you know, just anything else, so, uh, multi-strike, for instance, can be a better ODK enabler, plus can be utilized on more than just the dragon, well, not to say that face dragons is a dragon only spell card, just works better with dragons. I I'm getting kind of lost in the sauce here. I do think Faith the Dragon is maybe okay, but again, doesn't really crack open the seat here. It's just kind of a another ODK enabler uh, at times. So, uh, yeah, we'll move on though to the Frog Prince. Frog Prince is uh, honestly a card I think deserving of a bit of an A tier slot there. Uh, a bit of a beefy boy at 6-7. Uh, being able to heal the knights, which is, you know, great, cool. Uh, I think more importantly, though, the resolvability it carries is very, very beneficial. Being able to not only trade with units, but uh, potentially more than one. Uh, being able to have that resolve here keeps it alive, keeps it in play, forces more to be done to remove it, uh, which can be very beneficial for you, being able to put more resources out from your opponent to get rid of a singular frog that could deal, you know, upwards of uh, six, seven, maybe eight damage is pretty impactful so i think frog prince is definitely one of those cards that uh deserves his a tier slot maybe not for his knight-esque synergy but because he's just a hell of a boy that can uh tank a few shots for sure uh so for that he gets up into the a tier and following that another uh late game boy arcanon general um probably gonna feel like it to be on this one as well uh, our general has some great overall synergy with some last will based stuff, but obviously outside of that, he is very, very pointless. But usually the last will stuff you could do is pretty great. Sunflowers Burst, Rider, uh, Lumberjack Draw, Tarius Files Draw, just to name a few there. Um, being able to reuse those abilities multiple times means that general can get some insane value. Um, granted, if he, you know, has a last will target to bounce off of. Uh, but again, outside of that, he doesn't really do much. He's a four-six body, which you know you don't want to you don't want to run typically in that six gold slot for any other deck. Uh, so I, I think for mainly just the last will support, he is great at that. He is very good at that, but I don't think uh, that deserves any sort of like A tier or higher level praise here. Although talk about A tier, we'll go back for a minute. I think Sentry Golem, a hot take here. But I think it does belong in the A tier of cards. Again, I think this one can be contested easily as well. I'm open for discussion on this one. But mainly the thing I'm looking at with Golem right here is the Deflect ability he carries. Deflect is a very, very, very important keyword to have on a card here. It essentially is just spell protection. Being able to dodge things like Execution, Murder, Blue Fire Bolt, all of these burns and removal spells that, uh, you know, cards like... Uh, well, not like him, but, you know, cards in general face uh, as they get bigger and bigger. Uh, but with Golem, if you keep him alive and keep him hidden for a turn, he grows into a big 4-8 unit, which, of course, can be buffed uh, later on uh, by globals or just, you know, reawakened for even bigger stuff happening. Uh, I think Golem is just uh, a very underutilized card uh, outside of Awaken. Uh, he's definitely great and, you know solid in the awakened archetype itself but uh beyond that i think he deserves a little bit more love so i think i'm going to put him in the a tier uh for now all right next up is dwarven green again i'm going to put this right here where it belongs the f tier uh really just a weak ramp card treasure one an extra gold you got a dwarf it really doesn't accomplish much and i think uh it just 
doesn't really deserve to be an epic card in general, actually. So, uh, you're gonna sit in the, uh, F tier for now. And from that, we transition to one dwarf card to another, Grudge Bearer. Now, Grudge Bearer I had some conflicting thoughts about. I mean, it does have Thunderstrike, which is very, very powerful, but it is slow. It does have a dwarf ability, but we don't really see it that often. Uh, I, I think I think it's going to be another C tier card for me. Uh, I don't think it uh, really sees much these days and really accomplish much. Um, yeah, it kind of just hangs out. It, it powers up dwarf decks for sure, but we don't see enough of those out there to really uh, grant Grudge Bear, but have a higher position on the tier list. It just uh, doesn't really do much these days. So uh, yeah, I'm going to sit in the C tier. Dragon's Horde, the next card on the list, I think, uh, probably, uh, maybe another controversial choice here. I might go with B, though. I might have to just put this in B tier. Uh, we talked about how important the ramp is, and of course, this is, again, a guaranteed ramp, uh, so that is pretty neat there, uh, but, I mean, it's three gold. Once it's utilized, it's kind of gone. It's out the window. You can maybe have an argument for it being in C tier since it is also just gold, but uh, I kind of I kind of feel like maybe the three gold is a little bit more important because you could do some pretty uh, drastic things with it. Of course, going from turn two to turn five is a major, major shift that your opponent may not be ready for. Uh, and of course, later in the line here, you can get more gold flow and do some more things. So definitely think... Uh, Dragon Sword worth uh, worth the slot there. Maybe, maybe not, but I'm I'm comfortable with it in the B tiers. Uh, moving on, you got the Elvish Hunter in the follow up. Um, yikes! Not entirely sure if uh, she should be C or higher. I guess it depends on how much you value your companions. It's really you're only running Spiny and Centaur these days as your companion package. I mean, there's Forest Watcher, but those are the only three companions. It feels like Hunter was a victim of the unfinished product of CNC2, where there was supposed to be more companion support. And unfortunately, it just never came to fruition. So uh, I'm thinking maybe another, another C tier card here. Um, I don't know about that one, though. You could let me know in the comments if you agree or disagree with that one. I could, I, I'm willing to hear some arguments more on uh, Elvish uh, Hunter, but for now, I think it's going to be in the C tier. Moving on, you've got Iken. Iken going to be in the B tier for me, honestly. Uh, I think Iken's a great little pseudo removal spell for the ninjas if they're not, or if your opponent is not uh, being careful about his plays or being a little too aggressive. Uh, the four attack is a big boost, but first strike is more crucial there, being able to trade for free uh with a unit uh while you're on the board here and only at two gold is a very very big swing that you could potentially make in a game so i think uh i can very good to accomplish those sort of yeah you know swing moments uh, maybe not as much as uh drain life which is in the a tier or uh anything like that or the dragon's fire um but i still think it's a neat little card to pull out every once in a while uh just kind of showcase like hi I can remove your card for two gold and then still play, you know, all this other stuff. What are you going to do now? Going to spend seven gold in your pirates to pop my one unit now. It, it's uh, it's an interesting move there. It is an interesting uh, move to throw Iken into a deck. So I respect they're going to have to give it a B. And we'll move on into Keeper of the Doorway as our next card here. going to be another A tier for me. I think Keeper... Very dangerous if left unchecked here. He's got a decent stat line at 5 gold, about 2-6, which can be, of course, increased to 7 and 4-8, which, again, on turn 5 is pretty good, but also generate those additional units here from the undead pool. Now, uh, I remember we talked a while ago about Mordok and how his undead pool made him very powerful. Uh, Keeper can be, you know, in line for that same pool. Banshee, Wraith. Horseman, none of those options really miss per se. I guess it depends on your scenario, what you want in the moment. But all three of those cards are fantastic. Horseman for free damage, Banshee for a free spell, Wraith for a stupidly big body. All those cards have amazing uh, potential uh, just in any scenario. So to keep to pull any of those from Keeper, I think, is fantastic. And for that, Keeper deserves the A tier ranking. All right, and the next card needs no further introduction on the list. Lightning Blade going to jump up again to join our S tier of cards. 
very very good not only is it a 2-2 buff which we discussed as being very good but also the chain 3 which has some incredible potential to be a complete and utter game ender for a few decks on the on the ladder uh lightning blade is always a card that people are cautious about in the higher ranks when playing up against blue always a card you got to be thinking about at all times uh the chain 3 is very devastating and uh very dangerous uh usually a great backer removal if your opponent is uh foolish enough to lead a connection to the back line uh it's a way that you can uh easily just deal some big damage or maybe even win the game on castle if you had the opportunity here i think you know lightning blade is what a pocket five damage in your in your uh in your possession there and of course pairing that with multi-strike moving that around with uh different positions of chain there's so much beneficial uh, to this card that if you're not running in any of your blue decks, man, you are missing out. Uh, Lightning Blade, an absolute powerhouse of a card and a uh, contender worthy of the S tier. Following that, though, we've got the Lich. Lich, I do think, is another contender for the A tier alongside Keeper. Uh, Freeze is just a general pain in the ass to deal with. And, of course, uh, Lich being able to pull that off on two units is pretty cool, pretty impactful. Uh, his downside is annoying, but can be avoided pretty easily. Just, you know, provided you don't throw any additional units on board before you can trigger the Lich's Freeze. So, like, doing a little bit of training beforehand. Uh, once you have that set up, uh, Lich should be able to, uh, you know, you know, come with no downside, actually, you know, if you play it properly. So, being able to freeze those two units, being able to, uh, you know, avoid the downside. What it keeps it out of S tier, though, is obviously... Uh, the random targeting on the freeze. Uh, you can't exactly choose where Lich's freeze will go, so kind of have to chance there. And if you got a lot of targets on board to do so, not anything that, not everything that you want to get frozen may get frozen. So because of that, we'll see Lich hang out in the A tier alongside the Keeper. Following that though is the Luminaris spell. Uh, ooh. I mean, I'm tempted to put this in the B tier as well, mainly because uh, it's a huge burst of AoE. Um, four damage is a little bit more powerful than Dragon's Fire out of the hand. Plus, uh, it being able to hit buildings in the back line is a bit more dangerous than Dragon's Fire if uh, your opponent can get it in the right spot. Or if you can get it in the right spot, it'd be dangerous for your opponent. Uh, what keeps it though out of the A tier and the S tier is it, it is faction or not even faction, excuse me, archetype locked into knights. So you have to have some form of knight in your deck at any time to run Luminaris. Granted, that's not that hard to do with options like Knight of Flowers and Questing Knight being generic options. And of course, some of the other contenders like Frog Prince, uh, when you throw it into the mix as well as being a knight. You have some opportunities and targets for sure to land a Luminaris. The problem is you just have to get to the other side first, which can be a little troublesome depending if you're or if you're already in a losing game. So for that, Luminaris is going to hit our B tiers as well next to Icon. Following that, we've got Magmasaur. Now, uh, Magmasaur great for dinosaur strategies, but that is literally all he is capable of doing. Um, he can grow Brig uh, and most likely, you know, pretty game-endingly powerful if uh, paired with a Dino Nest. But I, he doesn't usually get to that point. It doesn't usually get to that point with Magma Sword, unfortunately. So I think for that, you have to go into the, uh, not the F tier, but the C tier, my friend. I think uh, you just don't cut it for the B tiers. All right, next up, we've got Meditation. Now, Meditation is going to be a card, I think, that uh, fits in the B tier for me personally. Uh, a great tool for Awakened decks. A great way to get some 3-3 uh, three, three stat lines on a card here. You've got the Reawakening tools. Of course, they become even bigger. But beyond that, doesn't really get much else uh, going for other decks here, uh, especially when there are some better tools that could be using for a lot of their other decks uh, that are currently in the format. So... Uh, I think Meditation, a fine card, but probably going to be a B tier for me. But speaking of buffs here, Necromancer going to go ahead and squeeze right into the A tier. There, there we go. Uh, Necromancer is probably one of the most overlooked global buffs technically in the game. You've got Blacksmith, Armory, and Fat Bar, which are all, you know, around the 3-4 cost range here. And of course, then you got Necromancer creeping in at the 5 uh, and of course, her global buff is archetype specific, really only work for undead units, but 
gets that extra ability of uh, attaching uh, fear to it as well, being able to hit something and if it survives, pushing it all the way back uh, like you would see in the uh, in the card fear. So I, I think for that, it's it's uh, you know getting that extra fear is something that definitely cannot be overstated. But because it is archetype specific, I think Necromancer does fall a little bit flat of the S tier. It, it definitely is good. And of course, we already talked about how good the undead pool can be here with certain cards. So giving all those units an additional ability of uh, that knockback, that fear, if you will, is definitely something that uh, people should be mindful of. So I definitely think Necromancer can be a good card coming in at the A tier here. Next up, Dinosaur Nest. Now, Dinosaur Nest uh it's a hard one it is a hard one because we've already talked about putting uh magma store in this sort of c tier position here but dinosaur nest is the card that kind of enables dinosaurs to exist as an archetype at all so i think when you talk about that it's the decision of where do you want to put nest either in b or c i think you know in general in the wider scheme of things it is a C tier card, but it does enable pretty much the entirety of the dinosaur archetype to exist. You know, it's the reason why you've got, you know, the big dinosaur burst, why they're so powerful. And, you know, Dinosaur Nest is the lead in to those bold evolution plays if anyone's daring to make them. But I don't know. I think uh, as a card that exists in the whole, you need dinosaurs to make them work. And they are just... Uh, you know, a couple of stat boosters that, uh, you know, uh, I, now that I'm hyping it up here, do I want to move it into B? That's the question. Ah, uh, you know, I think I'm going to put it into B. I think, honestly, B or C is a fair choice for these guys, regardless. Uh, but, yeah, because, I mean, that Dinosaur Nest is, again, I I'm going to keep repeating because it's so true. It's the reason why dinosaurs exist as an archetype. It all revolves around that card. Uh, but moving on now, you got the Trap Door Ninja. Uh, 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 yeah, I, honestly, maybe maybe C tier here for me. Uh, again, probably on the same level as uh, Dinosaur Nest here. As in, this is sort of the, well, one of the two big payoffs to playing trap-focused decks. Dojo, of course, being one of them, which of course can draw a lot from your deck. But also the Ninja can grow very very huge uh it can become very big very menacing uh thanks to all the trap activations you can get off the problem is if your opponent knows how to outplay traps knows how to play around them uh, unfortunately he won't get very big at all he's got evasive which is cool uh which is why he's staying out of the f tier but uh i think because traps can be pretty outplayed or played around if your opponent knows how to uh, navigate that trap throw ninja becomes pretty useless and uh you know just kind of falls by the wayside here plus trap decks you know tend to uh well i guess i shouldn't say that maybe they just don't draw it but i don't know i feel like sometimes trap decks may be uh, shy away from trapdoor ninja because uh there are better options that you can be running in general uh that can you know just happen to benefit off the traps as well so uh do they go for that or do they go for the trapdoor ninja i think there are you know times where people just go for trapdoor ninja because it is you know on theme but uh, yeah, I think Trapto Ninja probably a C tier card for sure. And uh, speaking of C tier cards, Pack of Wolves. Uh, as much as it pains to do so, I think it's going to be another C tier as well. Um, I love Pack. I've used Pack in the past. I love to use uh, Pack again in the future probably. But it is a card that I think it, it, it's just underwhelming at eight gold, uh, getting all those wolves out, which do buff each other and fellow beasts, but. Uh, how many more beasts are you going to have on the board by the time the pack of wolves comes out by the time you know all that gets going here and of course you know three for eight golds eh, eh, uh, it's a little underwhelming there so i kind of understand why people kind of shy away from it for it for eight gold you can be doing a lot more on the board there are more impactful cards in the same slot as well so yeah it just makes sense pack is going to be a c tier card Next up, you've got the Panda. Now, honestly, Panda literally going to be up in the A tier for the same exact reasons that Lich is. Uh, it's a great way to remove some pesky problems by bouncing them back into your opponent's hand, especially if they are a bit more on the expensive side. The issue is, of course, that random targeting can bite you in the ass 
if you have no way to address it or if you failed to do so properly uh which is why it's not going to be an s tier card in my opinion it just uh unfortunately has that that, that built-in randomization that can come back in the wrong way so panda though great addition to the a tier as well oh f uh... Following this is War Party. Uh, the history I've got with this card. And as much, as much as I would love to just throw this thing in the F tier, I'm going to be professional here. I'm going to do my best. I'm going to throw it in the B tier. Although that's gonna still going to be flames too. Because honestly, the War Party people out there think that this card is godly. Uh, but no, I think B tier is fair for it. Uh, War Party, especially more in a format where we've been seeing a lot of uh, games and quicker, uh, it's it's harder for War Party to survive. Of course, they've had uh, success being able to utilize freeze and stall things out to then go into the War Party, whether it is in the classic yellow blue variant or in the red blue Raka Party variants, uh, which I think have become more popular than the original uh, yellow blue uh, War Party uh, variant. Uh, but regardless, I do think it is a B tier card. I gotta give it, you know, the respect. I gotta give it, uh, you know, professional here. It is a solid card for what it does, uh, but I don't think it cracks that level of A tier or S tier, uh, you know, in, in, in general. It, it is just, you know, the, the one card explosive big boy party bonanza. Uh, but, you know, if your deck doesn't really revolve around that, then you're not really playing War Party, so... Following that, you've got Pegacorn here. Pegacorn, an interesting card, uh, in my opinion. I think another card for the B tier selection. Uh, I think it is a fine sort of rain for what it does. It, it's five five. It has Rainbow Shield, which is sort of spell protection in a way. It kind of prevents any burn damage from being taken. Uh, the issue, I don't think it really protects from removal in case I might be remembering that wrong, maybe? I don't know, Rainbow Shield is sort of weirdly worded from Deflect, but it is a card that can protect against sort of the burn damage of things like Blue Firebolt, Chain, um, Flame Storm, things like that, which, you know, can be pretty common, pretty rampant when you're facing off against Warlock or Viking players. So, I think Pegacorn is a fine inclusion, but definitely not the best card you could be using in general. Uh, it's just really, it's a very generic uh, card elsewhere. You know, it's 5-5 it's five, five for 5. It, the only thing you're getting out of it is that Rainbow Shield. And if you value that highly, then, you know, more power to you. Uh, but I don't think I am in the same suit. So, for that, Pegacorn going to hit that B tier. Uh, following this... Perseverance. Oh, look at you. Going to be in the fat F tier column, my friend. Uh, Perseverance, I'm going to say outright, is trash. Um, no one's been able to really successfully pull this off. Um, so many conditions for such a very mi minute payout. Having all your damage units gain in armor and I think a point of attack at the end of the day, it really is just not good there are much better cards you could be playing than perseverance and even then perseverance if you're having to pull it off we've just seen it it is it is not it is not worth it in the slightest so for that perseverance is going to be sitting in our f tier following this molten pillar Ooh, molten pillar is a bit of a tricky one i gotta admit uh molten pillar molten pillar Pillar, where do I want to put you? Oh, uh, baby, as much as it might pay me to just overpopulate the B tiers, I mean, it just feels like... Maybe, maybe... I think it's an argument again. You're going to throw out that conversation in the mix for A or B. I think that's where I'm leaning between right now. Uh, Pillar can be very brutal at just existing. Normally when it goes down, it never comes off the board unless your opponent is going to utilize it for their own gain. Uh, or they want to look, you know, they're trying to bounce something off of it or have range units to take it out. Uh, it's very annoying, not only dealing the five Inferno damage, but also the last real explosion of five. Uh, if this thing, of course, in combination with Winds of Nor gets on Castle, it's very devastating. Uh, 
being just a general roadblock in other decks is a pain. Uh, it, it is a fair card um, to, you know, or not fair. Well, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a decent, it's a decent card, I will say. It is a fair card in, in terms of power. Um, and I think, I mean, I don't know. I think I'm digging, I'm digging more of a hole with myself with this one. It, it's a B tier card. It's a decent card. I'm going to go ahead and move on now into Killer Rabbit, which unfortunately, uh, Killer Rabbit is going to go ahead and join the C tier ranks as well. Um, Rabbit used to be a, you know, big bit of a powerhouse here, but nowadays doesn't really seem to get out much. Uh, again, it's the case of just b it being power crept by better options. Kind of became this weaker incarnation of what it once was and uh, has not really recovered since then. Uh, there have been times where people have utilized uh, Dwarven Scope to create Scope Rabbit shenanigans, but, um, you know, those days seemingly have passed, although some people still try it in the green-white when they have the opportunity. Uh, but yeah, Killer Rabbit, just not what it used to be. I don't think it's really super strong in the current format either, so for that reason, it's sitting in our C tier. Next up, Demonic Rage. Uh, simple B tier. Uh, ooh, where'd it go? Over here. Uh, B tier. Uh, it's a card that you usually never see bought out unless someone is going for the OTK kill. Uh, it's really a, what it is used for, except it's a tier above E Strike, which we mentioned was a similar OTK enabler, because it's much easier to facilitate a single unit getting to 20 attack than it is to clear the board so that way your three strikes land on a specific target. Uh, almost similar to Multi Strike is Demonic Rage in a sense, except uh, one big attack value. Um, and multi strike we all know is probably better than E strike in terms of uh, you know big damage cards. So uh, for that reason, demonic rage gonna sit in the B tier for now. I think that is a fine place for it. Following up though is the smuggling ring. Now this one again a bit tricky to determine honestly, um, mainly because you can get a lot of spells or a few spells, and they could be good spells or shit spells. Kind of everything leaning uh, in the middle here uh, with Smuggling Ring, honestly. Um, there's a duality between, like I said, not getting enough spells or getting too many spells. And then, of course, the quality of them can sometimes vary. A lot of minor spells in the pool. So, you know, you could end up with some dud ones like the Dwarven Greed. Uh, or you can just end up with some good ones uh, like Blessing of the Trents or Ikin Hisatsu. Um, but of course, to facilitate that, smoking ring does require that treasure, which can be also a little harder to get going as well. So, uh, for those reasons, smuggling ring is going to sit in the B tier. Ronin, of course, our next card up. Uh, uh, uh Ronin is a bit tricky. Um, honestly, probably another, it's, it's our third straight B, uh, but hey, it works. Uh, Ronin pretty good with the first strike, uh, if uncontested, although usually blue fire bolts come and hit him directly in the face, he is vulnerable to that. Uh, but like I said, the first strike is very, very useful for, uh, just controlling the board state. Uh, sometimes, of course, cards unable to pass over Ronin kind of just sit and die, and, uh, it gives him or whoever actually plays the Ronin, uh, some pretty wide access to the board. So, uh, with that, Ronin's going to sit in our B tier, uh, following up is uh, Santa. It, it, it is Santa. Now, of course, there's the big joke. Red Man's going to put Santa in the B tier. But no, I'm going to put Santa in C. I think uh, I, I hyped him up too much with, with uh, him giving a legendary card uh, as opposed to your opponent not getting legendaries. But still... Uh, the trade-off between what you and your opponent can get can sometimes be very beneficial or very disadvantageous depending on who gets what. And of course, you don't want to run that risk of your opponent getting a bigger power card than you and uh, potentially using that said power card to swing the game. So, uh, very risky to run Santa nowadays. So, uh, I think for that reason, if you do end up wanting to play him, probably a safer idea just to not do that. Uh, 
And of course, following that, we've got the School of Knowledge. Now, School of Knowledge is actually very difficult to rank on this specific list. Uh, because when we look at School of Knowledge, we know that School of Knowledge draws for uh, every gold point gained. Every, uh, yeah, gold gain. Blech. Can't speak English. And on its own, that really only pertains to one specific deck where it's been strong in. And of course, that is the Greed School, uh, where players draw out their entire deck utilizing that treasure and that gold uh, to then play a bunch of big creatures. Uh, on its own, though, School of Knowledge, I think, is definitely more of a C tier card. It really only has one major application, and that is in the deck we discussed. Outside of that, School of Knowledge has never really been prominent. No one has decided to uh, run it in decks outside of those colors. And that just is because it is purely only for... It, it's, it's its own self-contained archetype in one card. And because of that, it, it just... It just is a C tier card. I mean, when we're talking about, you know, decks and archetypes. The grade school deck is certainly a much higher power, uh, but the individual card is going to be sitting in the C tier for now. Following that, you've got Search for the Truth. And uh, honestly, I'm going to say it is a F tier card. Um, now, it is a draw three spell, and of course, it does reduce your uh, dragons if you draw any. But it is six gold, and by six gold, you really shouldn't be wasting an entire turn uh, just looking for resources. I mean, unless you are low on cards. Uh, but the idea is, by that point in the matchup, you should be establishing your dragon. You should have some sort of, uh, you know, body count on the board. You should have some support buffs. You know, the dragon temple, maybe an armory if you decide to go that route. Uh, you should you shouldn't really be just drawing three and potentially passing two. If you end up whiffing, that is your entire turn. You leave your opponent open to commit a better and bigger play than you with it. So uh, I don't really trust Search for the Truth uh, in Dragon decks anymore. Uh, they've been pretty funny, um, you know, drawing out some of the big uh, legendary dragons for reduced cost. But uh, I don't think Search for the Truth is just worth running. There are much better options that you can use to uh, combat some meta threats. So for that reason, I recommend keeping your shards when it comes to search for the truth. Uh, and then following that, you've got Shadow Slip. Uh, Shadow Slip, probably a B tier card. I mean, it's just a generic big bounce all card or bounce all units to hand type thing. Um, really only utilized in uh vanish balance focused decks doesn't really do much else outside of that so for that reason it is going to be sitting in our b tier sheep to the slaughter uh very very underutilized card and one that i think is a proper a tier card uh it's not easy to use but it doesn't have to be considering what it can provide to the board this basically gives any unit Thunderstrike, and of course that does amplify chain lightning so when you put the two and two together you create this big chain lightning effect with Thunderstrike that can be very very devastating uh, plus sheep the slaughter is also great to pull things closer it does have that built-in pull mechanic as well uh, to get range units perhaps closer to your units it's a nice little trump card that I don't think a lot of people play anymore but is definitely scary when it does hit the field uh, because it can provide so much to uh, Viking decks. Uh, the extra reach from the pull, uh, the amplified chain lightning, very, very damaging and uh, very underutilized. And of course, next, Thrill of the Victory from one Viking spell to another. Again, I think Thrill is probably a garbage spell. Uh, it is not great to main deck by any means. It is a 2-1 stat boost for when your unit kills something and uh you know if you're using it in a rougher engagement uh you may not be walking out of that engagement with the health left for the plus one to matter substantially uh the only way you might get big use out of this if you is if you are facing up against token or swarm decks and you can use thrill the victory to continuously power a big chunker so that way uh the damage from the tokens is nullified and instead fueling a bigger and uh, healthier creature even then though uh, it's it, you know the one for one trades and it it, it kind of gets weird so 
I, I just don't recommend using the Thrill of the Victory. It is not, not that great. Uh, following that, you've got Living Vines. Uh, for now, I think Living Vines is in the uh, F tier, keep your shards category. Um, not really much to comment on though with Living Vines. It's a card that we never see pop up. Uh, not because it's bad, I just maybe because no one's got any sort of major use for it. Um, although I say it's not bad and I put it in the F tier. Uh, it's just the same problem with Arbor. It's slow, it's clunky. It's got a regen ability here with, uh, with combo. I, no, I think, was it combo or was it survival instinct? Regardless of, uh, which keyword it is, it does have this, you know, healing factor to it. But it's just not enough. Uh, it's got five health, I think. Uh, and by that point, when it comes into play here by like turn three you're moving into turn four and five there are there are other options excuse me <coughs> that are just i think better than the living vines so for now i'd rather keep your shards if i were you when it comes to the living vines following that you've got the salahar voyager uh hmm, probably a b tier card it's Voyager itself is not very impressive. It's a 2-1 for 4 gold. Uh, although it does reduce the cost of any monster. So usually you're following this up with a bigger play like Minotaur or Grendel behind it. And that's some scary beef for turn 4, I will admit. So uh, for that reason, you could probably consider Voyager a B tier. Just because it brings a lot of hefty backup uh, with it when it hits the field. So uh, yeah, I think Salah Voyager is fine. B. Following that, you've got Forest Watcher, the worst of the companion lineup. Probably fair to put this in the C tier. Not exactly F tier, because it is still a companion, can be spawned anywhere. But it is a bit clunkier than its counterparts here, sitting at 5 gold to summon. Gets a cool little shockwave effect, but it is also slow and sluggish, uh, meaning that it's not going to be able to deal instant damage like Centaur or Spiny would, which really sort of goes against why companions are used nowadays. Companions, of course, are utilized to poke into. Uh, all these important high targets like Tarius, uh, range units, buildings, uh, instantly. They they don't you really know they don't want to wait. They want to remove the threat now so they can of course utilize maybe more of what's on the field, more of what's in their hand, or make some more uh, emphatic plays here. The Forest Watcher, if that uh, two shockwave hit isn't killing anything, then it's just a four four body sitting there being annoying. Sure, it's a four four. But by five gold, there are things that could easily just pop out, kill it, and, you know, the opponent just moves on with their day. So, Forest Watcher, not the greatest companion, and for that reason, we're going to put it in the C tier. Following that is Wind Mage. Now, uh, probably, I, you know, it's probably another B, probably, uh, another, another B tier card. It's fine. I mean, it's a 2-2. Two -two which is, you know, not great stat lines for a range unit. It does get some cool little uh, pushback where, of course, everything's being sent uh, back a few spaces, gives you time, gives you stall potential with that. Uh, but once it does that, it's really fulfilled its goal. The 2-2 on the range body is okay, uh, but usually that's getting instantly removed or is caught in the crossfires of a flamestorm or a dragon's fire. So really not worth it to run Wind Mage, in my opinion. But hey, still not a bad card, so it is going in the B tier. And of course, our last card on the docket is going to be Witch Doctor. Now, I'm going to probably put this in... Uh, it's either... It's between C or F for me. Gonna go probably in C because it is a bit of a chonky, faster boy. Uh, we criticized Vines for being a 4 or 5, but it had slow and sluggish. Think of Witch Doctor as sort of the faster version of that. So it's great stat lines for the three gold cost. However, the issue is its last will has been very uh, detrimental to players uh, for running it. Uh, I think Witch Doctor does have some potential in some last will strategies, some synergies with Fenrir. We know we were experimenting with that a while back. Uh, but other than that, Witch Doctor just kind of doesn't do much. He's just sort of the big body that you have to pay a price for later down the line, which I don't think players have been keen on running nowadays in the current format. So for that reason, uh, Witch Doctor is going to hang out in the C tier. And with that, the tier list has been complete. Quite the sight, quite the sight indeed. 
lots of interesting choices that I think I've made that I didn't expect myself to make. I know I've done some uh, some switcheroos here uh, mid recording this, but uh, hey, I think overall this is looking like a uh, not too shabby list. But of course, I know there's gonna be those of you out there who want to move some things, and that is completely fine. We're open to discussion. We're open to changing things. I'll leave the link to this tier list in the in the description below in case you want to go ahead and uh, show me what you think the proper tier list should be. All right, and with that being said, folks, that will, of course, conclude our Epic Card tier list for today's video. Hopefully, you guys did enjoy. Uh, I know this probably took a little longer than you were anticipating, uh, but what can I say? When life throws you the many, many curveballs that it does, you have to adapt, overcome, and bounce back stronger than ever. And thankfully, we did do that um you know and i and i missed making videos i've i've sort of uh, on this little two week uh forced vacation in some part in some ways uh i've been sort of re-motivated to make a couple more videos uh not just a couple more you know we'll, 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 we're gonna keep making the content especially now with the way that the ladder is the cnc ladder is crazy it's a wild wild west out there and i can't wait to jump into it again for some more videos um but yeah, I think that is going to do it for me. Hopefully you guys did enjoy the video. Hopefully uh, you aren't disappointed. You might be, you know, scratching your head at maybe some of my opinions for the tier list, but that is understandable. Uh, people had the same idea during the legendary tier list. Uh, but yeah, hopefully you guys did enjoy. And I'm just happy to be back on YouTube. I, I can't stop talking. You guys can already see. I am, I'm just excited to return to the platform, interact again with you guys. And uh, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to make some more videos. So we're going to jump back into it over the next few days. But folks, if you guys did enjoy, be sure to let me know. Leave your thoughts on the tier list uh, down below. And of course, be sure to uh, mess around with it yourself in the link in the description. Let me know what you guys uh, make. I want to see how your tier lists might be a little different than mine. Because I know some of you uh, love, love, love to challenge my, uh, my opinions. So looking forward to that. Uh, but yes, leave a comment down below as well. Be sure to like the video if you enjoyed. Be sure to share with your friends. And be sure to subscribe if you're new or haven't done so already to the channel. It's the best way you can share your support to us here and help us grow and expand our lovely little community here on YouTube. But folks, that is going to be it for me for now. So, until next time, stay gaming. <laughs>